thank you for being with us today, traveling from the United States to join us. We appreciate it. I thought we'd dive straight in. Uh, you spent about a year at the State Department as the Director of Policy Planning. And since you've left, from what I've read and we spoke, you were a bit critical of what was happening and what you saw at the State Department and warning that it may be a place that's a bit anti-Israel, a lot of never-Trumpers, as you had said. Is that really the case of what's going on there? I think it's a, a, a great question, but the larger question is what's happening with U.S. foreign policy that relates to Israel. Um, and it's not really just the State Department, and it's not as simple as never-Trumpers or the bureaucracy against the president. Um, I think it is the fact that the Trump doctrine isn't really taken very seriously by many, even Trump supporters. Um, and I think it makes it difficult for the president to um, realize his policy preferences all, um, often. Well, I, I just want to cut you up. So you, you mentioned the Trump doctrine. Uh -huh. And there are a lot of people, and I'm assuming some of the diplomats who are even here with us today, would say, what doctrine? It's, it looks like a chaotic, chaotic mess. One day it's this, one day it's that. There's in, not, not a coherent policy, but you think there is a doctrine. I actually do, and I think the chaos is born of the fact that so many um, in Washington don't support the fact or believe the fact that the president has a systematic set of ideas about the direction and purpose of U.S. foreign policy um, and the defense of the West, which includes Israel. So if you don't mind for a second, I'd like to Please. outline um, what I think he's been trying to do. If you look at the campaign um, in 2016 and American presidential campaigns are now local campaigns all over the world. Everyone's following. I turned on my TV this morning. The impeachment um, process is, is, is front and center here. So if you took seriously what um, Donald Trump as a candidate was saying and what he's done the first couple of years in office, to me, one would conclude um, that there is, in fact, a Trump doctrine that marks off the um, U.S. foreign policy in a different way than what we've done for the better part of the last 70 years. One of the pillars includes a return to national sovereignty, the idea that the nation state is the core unit of analysis. Um, President Trump has been unafraid to say that international organizations, international law, and multilateral organizations matter. He's never said that they don't matter, but um, the nation state is the place where economic growth and prosperity come from, where people are protected, and it is indeed the core unit against these others in the world. They're kind of a, additions to what nation states can do, and secondary. A second pillar, um, is that burden sharing um, has to take place among um, nations of common purpose. He's also talked about having new regional partnerships, including, for example, Israel in the emerging trilateral relationship among the U.S., Israel, and India as a way to counter China um, in Asia. Um, he's talked about reciprocity in trade agreements and other international agreements the U.S. enters. These are very different pillars than not just the Obama doctrine, but the way that we have thought about engaging with the world um, in the post-World War II era. Um, I think they ground everything the president does. Um, I would like to see those around him take his ideas a lot more seriously. I think we would have less quote unquote chaos in US foreign policy. Um, but these are consistently the ideas the president advances. So how does Israel fit into that picture though? You mentioned the trilateral option or scenario, something with India against uh, the, the rise of China, but where else does it fit into the picture? Israel is a central part of what this administration is attempting to do under the Trump doctrine in these ways. When the president talks about burden sharing and regional partnerships, um, Israel is the democracy in the Middle East. Israel is the strong economic and military power in the Middle East. The U.S. can't move without a close alliance with Israel in the Middle East, especially as the president tries to right-size the U.S. military commitment and involvement in a number of countries in the broader region, um, the Middle East and um, South Asia. So in that way, I think it's 
clearer for Americans the role of the, the U.S.-Israel relationship in the past. Also, a part of the doctrine is, um, I think, a clarity of language. And that clarity of language and purpose got us to moving our embassy to Jerusalem, unprecedented official visits to the Western Wall, on and on and on. Um, and so Israel is a key pillar. If the goal of all of this, the Trump doctrine and other aspects of U.S. foreign policy, um, is to buy all of us a generation or two more of freedom in the world with the U.S. as a predominant actor on Earth, I don't see how that happens without Israel. The, how, how do you view the statement that came out this week uh, by the Secretary of State, Pompeo, regarding the legality of Israeli community settlements over the Green Line in the West Bank? How does that fit into this policy of, is that the clarity of language that you mentioned? I, I think so, and you know, I, w I heard the earlier um, conversation, the anti-Semitism panel, and there was some discussion back and forth about um, that decision and announcement by Secretary Pompeo. Um, I think that we're going to see more of these kinds of decisions that represent the president's views um, and that are consistent with what he has said he would do. You know, I always tell people around the world when I give talks, um, one of the times that you can know um, American politicians are telling the truth, and this sounds counterintuitive, but it's in presidential campaigns. Um, listen at what they say they will do. Often they do it because the commitments they make become hand-tying um, hand and binding commitments for a coalition that got them elected. I think what we're seeing um, with the more aggressive and clear Israel policy is just a fulfillment of the president's views and what he said he would do in the election campaign. But, but if, if there's a Palestinian who would be with us on the stage right now from the Palestinian Authority, they would say this is just another example of this administration's bias against us and how Trump, Pompeo, whoever it is in the administration cannot be an honest broker, not Jared Kushner, not his deal of the century. It's, it's, it's a non-starter. No, oh, I just think that would be a hard argument to make, given that there's so few in Washington who really, as I just said, as a, when we started this conversation, who even attempt to understand what the president is doing. I don't think the Palestinians lack um, a, a, a lobby force in Washington, um, both inside the government and outside. So there is strong support um, for them not just in the State Department, but throughout the national security community. Um, I think the presidents are try trying to address some of the issues around Israel security, but not at the expense of anyone else. So in your time in state, you know, we, we hear often in Israel how there's like an institutionalized bias at the State Department, a foggy bottom against the state of Israel. Uh, and, that, and that's how it's been for decades. Is that, is that really the case? Is, did you encounter that? I think there is some of that, but not just as, at state, as I said, but throughout our government. Um, but it's m not so much that there is an institutional bias. I think at the leadership level, there's been a lack of direction that allows, I think, and I don't want to call them bureaucrats, but those who are part of government on a more permanent basis to go in a direction that would support Israel. Um, it's hard for leaders, I think, in the U.S., often when they're trying to satisfy so many constituencies um, to be as strong and declarative as um, President Trump has been. He reminds me of President Reagan um, in that way. You know, I've, I've written a lot about President Reagan. What the um, in part of our government that is responsible for foreign policy has needed is direction. And I think it's been missing that in the 21st century ra around Israel. Now it has it. It's going to take time for the institutional part of our government to, on foreign policy to catch up. But it now does have the kind of leadership that we need. One thing that a lot of people on the other side of the aisle, the Democrats say, is that all of these different steps, gestures, what, what, whatever you want to call them, that Trump has given, President Trump has given to, to Israel, recognition of Jerusalem, the embassy, the settlements, the Golan Heights, it can all be rolled back on the afternoon of January 20th, 2021, just after the next president, if a Democrat, is uh, inaugurated. Is that really possible? Um, 
Partly yes and partly no. And in terms of our system of government, um, the center of action, the way that our founders um, organized um, the U.S. and wrote the Constitution. The president is the center of action. And that's a lot of energy around one person and a lot of power. Um, but once a president puts building blocks in place, it is difficult to unravel them. The JCPOA has, um, it's been difficult to unravel, but um, had it been a firmly Senate-confirmed um, treaty, it would be a whole different world for us on that issue. But it was put together with a lot of dissent in the first place. And President Trump was able to focus in on the difficulties with that agreement that many Americans um, understood to be the case. So I think he's reflecting a, a growing American sentiment and it will be difficult for a new president to come in and try to, what, move our embassy out of, of Jerusalem. I don't think that that will happen. But it also speaks to the fact that the president really needs eight years to make his commitments um, firm. So he needs another four years then. <laughs> and I, yes. just want to ask you, I just want to ask you finally, on, uh, on Tuesday, four rockets were fired from Syria into Israel. Israel is, is fighting a war already overtly with the Iranians, right? Uh, there's a lot of talk of the shadow war, but this is happening on our northern border with Syria. They're trying to entrench themselves with firing rockets. Israel then retaliated, hit dozens of targets across Syria. Do you really think there's a chance before uh, 2021, before the president, if he wins or his successor, whoever comes in, that the Iranians will come back to the negotiating table or nothing is going to move in the next year? It's a tough time for the Iranians, and we see that with the protest. Um, as they try to um, hike up oil prices within their country. Um, the protests are a breath of fresh air for those of us who've been trying to separate the Iranian government from the people. The people are not the problem. The government is the problem. I think they're finding um, just less um, support around the world, around the region, um, for what they're doing, their terrorism, their aggression against Israel, um, their um, repression of their own people, killing their own people. I don't know how much longer this can last, but this is not where I think Iran wants to be. And so um, I believe that they are going to be forced to the negotiating table, um, at hopefully soon, but um, they're not in great shape. And that's in part due to the United States and the resolve of Israel as well in the last couple of years. Dr. Skinner, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for coming.